We are now recording. Thank you, Luisa. Hello, everyone. I'm Jose Cisneros. Hello and welcome to the meeting of the Committee on Special Discipline Case Audit. As a reminder, this meeting is being recorded. We'll begin by taking the roll. Luisa? Broughton? Here. Ten. Cisneros? Here. Duran? Here. Seleg? Here. Shelby? You have a quorum. Thank you very much. Um, we will begin our meeting with uh, call for public comment. Um, we are open to receiving public comment from members of the public. Your public comment will be limited to three minutes. Um, in order to um, uh, raise your hand for public comment, please choose the raise hand feature on your Zoom. Um, on your Zoom screen, if you are a phone caller, um, I believe you push star nine and that will alert us that you are interested in making public comment. Um, if anybody is interested in making public comment, please indicate now. And Louisa, let us know if you see anyone indicating. We do not have any attendees. Once again, open for public comment. We don't have any attendees, Jose. Okay, then we'll close public comment and we'll move on to the calendar. We will reorder the calendar and we will take uh, the closed session first and then we will return to open session for our um, the remainder of our open session items. Um, if everyone uh, on the call uh, could uh, leave this Zoom call, go into the um, closed session link, and then we will come back out, and it shouldn't be too long, right, Leah, uh, for our closed session. That's right. All right. See you back in there, folks. Thanks very much. Luis, are you? We are now recording. Thank you. Uh, welcome back to the meeting of the Committee on Special Discipline Case Audit. Um, the committee met in closed session pursuant to Government Code Section 11126A1 and 11126C2. Um, and the committee has nothing to report um, from the closed session. And with that completed, we'll go back to uh, the agenda for today's meeting. And I believe that starts with the approval of two sets of minutes, the minutes for September 2nd and the minutes for the meeting of September 9th. Um, are, is there any discussion or a motion on those minutes? And can we pass them both together or do we need to do them separately? We can, we can pass them together. Fantastic. I'll make that motion, Jose. Thank you, Ruben. I'll second it. Thanks, Mark. Uh, Luisa, please take the roll. Broughton? Yes. Chen? Yes. Cisneros? Aye. Oh, I'm, sorry. I'm sorry, only if it's right. tied. I apologize. Duran? Yes. Select? Select? Sean may be having technical problems. Okay. Um, we do need one more vote. He, he looks like he's frozen. Yeah. Okay. Why don't we? Well, Cisneros did not vote, right? Because of the chair. So why don't we just vote? Right. I guess, yeah. Cisneros. Aye. Okay, thank you. The motion passes. Okay, great. All right, so yeah. let me... Go ahead. Uh, we're gonna start with Richard. Um, 
kind of going over, or I think maybe Richard, you want to introduce or remind folks of the materials that we sent out last week, and then we can talk a little bit about what we um, intend to do today, which is focusing on program design. Um, but Richard, did you want to start us off in any particular way? Um, well, we'll just start from the top. <laughs> okay. that'll, that'll work. Um, yeah, so we, uh, last couple of meetings, we talked uh, about some of the characteristics of programs of different states and uh, state bar equivalents in other countries, Australia and Canada. And so today what we wanna do is look at the different key elements of these programs and the different variations or flavors of each and talk about how they may or may not suit what the committee thinks would serve the public best in California. Um, at the end of this review, what we'd like to do is to go element by element and then decide, do we want, does the committee wish to continue uh, and get further information on these different elements or does it wish to remove them from consideration at this time? And, and the at this time means, so if, if the committee receives obviously additional information as a result of other work that's being done, it, it committee would not have precluded itself from, re, you know, from reintroducing elements that it had set aside um, at this point. So, um, so hopefully the materials you've received and our prior discussion will allow us to get straight into the heart of the matter and the merits or, or usefulness of these different elements. So Luis, if you could advance us through your screen. And on to the next, there we are. So we wanna talk about these program elements. We wanna identify which ones the committee wishes to pursue further. And then at the end, we will revisit our roadmap, uh, the meeting schedule and the topics and see where we, how we're tracking on that. So if we can go to the first slide. So the first element in a, in a <clears throat> client trust account proactive management program is the question of uh, registering these accounts or not. There are, Currently in California, IOLTA accounts are registered with the state bar, but client trust accounts are not. Um, there are different ways in which state bars across the country do this. Some of them simply uh, ask uh, attorneys when they pay their annual fees or dues, uh, are you in compliance with the rule? The rule states that you need to have a client trust account uh, if un, under these circumstances. So by saying they're complying, they're indicating that, but they do not provide further information about the account. There are other states where the attorney indicates uh, that they are holding client trust accounts, managing client trust accounts, and they list them by account number and by financial institution. Uh, there are yet another uh, type of registration occurs uh, in a program that has uh, a designation of a single responsible attorney. There are, there's a program that requires uh, a single uh, responsible attorney for every law firm with more than one uh, attorney in it. Uh, there is programs that allow that to be optional. Uh, such as North Carolina, where they have a trust account oversight officer who can be designated uh, by the firm. In, the, in those cases where you have the single point of uh, responsibility, uh, it is that person who ensures that all, and, and signs off on the registration of all accounts. So that's the, that's the first element that most, but not all, uh, audit programs contain. One of the benefits of having this register, in addition to, again, sending a sort of message that the bar is overseeing this uh, and has this information is in a random audit program, when it comes time to select the attorneys or for uh, random selection, the bar could choose to filter on only those attorneys who are managing these accounts. Obviously not every attorney 
uh, attorneys in public service and public office do not have these accounts, for example, or maybe a attorney in a regulatory environment. So uh, in, in, there is one state in, in which they do not, uh, in which they require every single attorney to do this, but that results in when they go to pick the random sample, about half of the attorneys they end up picking are not qualified to be audited because they don't have accounts. So they have to go back and redraw another random selection to build up their pool to where they need it to be. So that's one of the reasons why um, states choose to do this. And as we consider these, let me just add, while we consider these elements, uh, let's remind ourselves there's really three overarching purposes to a proactive client trust account management program. Uh, we've talked about this prior meetings, but they are education and support for attorneys who are managing these. Uh, the deterrence, the presence of a program indicating the bar is exercising close oversight. And third, detection. So those are the three purposes. Uh, some of these elements serve all of those purposes. Some of them serve one or two. So this is the first uh, element and we can stop here for discussion. Or if we can, or if you prefer, we could move through them all and come back and consider them at the end. Why don't we move through them all? If anybody has a question along the way, maybe they can indicate by raising their hand, but I think we'd like to hear, hear it. Okay, let's move to the next slide then. <clears throat> Uh, certification, this is a term that's a little bit confusing because some states <laughs> use certification to mean the same thing as other states mean registration. So some states ask attorneys to, uh, again, affirm, it, affirm a statement which says, I certify that I'm in compliance with, and then they cite the, the rule regarding client trust accounts. So by being in compliance, it, it also implies that you have set up and are managing these accounts correctly uh, should you be required to have them under the rule. Other states have both elements uh, separate. One is you first certify, I either have responsibility for these accounts or I do not. And the second element is, uh, and I am either in compliance and in one state, uh, you can also say I am not and here's why and attach an explanation. But the certification makes specific reference to the to the rules, statutes, in some cases. And in one state, it requires uh, the attorney to go through the specific rule clause by clause, section by section, and affirm each one. So it's, a, it's not a blanket uh, certification. It is a very uh, detailed, uh, detailed one. So that's a, there's registration, and then there's certification of compliance. Uh, two elements there at the, at the outset. And finally, there's uh, one state, Florida, that requires a written plan for law firms. Um, this includes, as it indicates here, the name of who's essentially managing the client trust account in every respect, in terms of check writing, reconciliation, so forth. Uh, and it also requires that that plan, be written plan, be distributed to every attorney in the firm. So that's, that is the one instance of that. The North Carolina version of this is, is that if the firm has elected to appoint a trust account oversight officer, that appointment and agreement as to what that job is and who is accepting it, that agreement has to be in writing. So that it's, there's no uh, room for confusion about who was responsible uh, for the accounts. So that's the uh, second element of uh, <clears throat> registration, which is certification. Any questions on that piece? All right, moving to the next slide. So now we come to the heart of a, many of these programs, which is audits. Um, and there are three related questions here. Who is audited? How frequently are they audited? And who conducts the audit? Um, you have a universal audit where every year, well, where all attorneys are audited. You have random sample, and the random sample can be drawn either entirely randomly, or it can be done 
uh, through what's called stratified random sampling, where you can create categories uh, by firm size, by type of practice, by geographic location, by whatever criteria you want, and then pick randomly within that. Um, North Carolina does that within judicial districts, for example. And then finally, there's risk-based sample, which is used in Canada and Australia, where the probability, the probability of being selected is based in part on the, your prior history of discipline, complaint, or audit findings, as well as the general overall pattern in the data as to the types of law practice. In Australia, for example, that means uh, largely solo practitioners in rural areas, to oversimplify a bit. Um, you can use risk-based sampling. So those are three different ways to get to who, uh, how frequently, uh, annually. So you could have all attorneys annually. That's a very heavy lift. Uh, Alberta, Canada does that. It's all automated and outsourced, um, as we talked about last time. Or you could have all attorneys, but with on another, on another frequency basis and so on. So these are mix and match uh, set of factors. Uh, you could have annual with exemption. So there could be an exemption period. If you were audited last year, uh, you could be exempt from being re-audited or in, within whatever period uh, the policy would state. Uh, there's also an e examples of uh, exemption based on submission of a CPA report. So if a law firm engages a CPA who has been trained by the state bar as to the guidelines to use and the criteria for auditing, uh, and that accountant submits a report that says that the client that the accounts are in good order, then that could exempt you for a period of time to be determined again by policy, a year, two years, year and a half. Um, and then finally, periodic uh, frequency. That means there are some places that will say, we're going to audit everyone, but over six years. So there's a cycle and they just uh, do the math to ensure that during that period they reach well, their goal is 100% of the, of the attorneys. So those are different ways to accommodate for frequency and for exemption. And then finally, there's the question of who conducts. Uh, in smaller states, uh, state bar audit staff uh, conduct the audits on site in person. Uh, there's also a variation of using a, of the state bar. There's sort of two, two versions of the use of certified public accountants. One is where the state bar contracts with a CPA firm to do all of the audits for the state that are being done in that cycle. Uh, the other is a variation in which the state bar requires firms to engage a CPA to uh, conduct and submit the findings of their reports. So those are a couple of variations on who conducts the audits. Any questions on this piece? All right, we go to the next. All right, so having in a program design sense, having obtained a, the universe of, of uh, accounts, having audited some of them, uh, now comes the question of what to do with the findings. Um, and again, that there's a question of who does that, uh, the state bar staff, uh, a CPA firm, uh, a combination of both. Uh, and, and there's really two kinds of analysis. One is the analysis of the individual audit report on an individual attorney or firm, uh, which has to do with you know, looking at individual accounts and individual attorneys. And the other is trying to look at patterns across the data. Um, is there a consistent problem with performing monthly, timely monthly reconciliations throughout the state? That might tr point to the need for greater support or training in that area, for example. Um, so it can be used to shape programmatic responses uh, like that. And then also there's the question of what the appropriate levels of response are uh, to the findings. Um, in Ontario, Canada, for example, there's, there's some six levels of response uh, depending on the audit findings. Uh, in the simplest case, the 
account is well managed and the file is closed. It could be a follow-up letter uh, that requires the firm to reply with documentation as to having corrected the problems identified in that letter. There could be an order for a re-audit within a period of time, say six months or nine months. Uh, there could be requirement for a detailed project plan uh, in a case where there's more a, a bigger array of issues that need to be fixed. Again, not that don't rise to the level of malfeasance, but are just a sign of mismanagement uh, that needs to be corrected. Uh, there's also, they make use of a practice management assistance program where they could appoint a law, in their case, law society staff person uh, or volunteer to mentor and to support and, and to teach, reteach, if you will, or maybe teach for the first time how to manage these accounts in detail. And finally, a uh, referral to formal discipline. So again, there's a, a range of these things. There's also different ways they get mixed and matched. There's There are programs that are like the practice management, but they, they represent kind of a diversion program. You have formal discipline awaiting you. If you complete the program, the, the discipline is, is waived and doesn't go on your record. So it's a bit like, like a drug court in, in criminal court uh, cases in California. For example, you go through the program, you fix the problem, you learn how to do it right. And so you fix the underlying problem and um, avoid the formal discipline. Uh, in terms of responding to the audit findings, in cases where there are on-site audits, uh, they do real-time error correction. They might find uh, that a check got you know, deposited in one client trust account that by accident should have been in another one. So they'll just immediately you know, work with the staff person and fix those. So things like that, they fix on the fly. They also have, uh, as part of their onsite process at the end of it, they will have a meeting with a managing partner. And if that's not the same person as the client trust account attorney, that person and anyone else that the law firm wishes to invite to learn from, and they'll review all the findings. Uh, that's obviously followed up with a written formal record of that uh, of those findings, and that's the notice of error and the need to correct. Um, sometimes they are placed under more intense supervision. So if there was a problem with mo monthly reconciliations, for example, they might be required to submit those monthly for two years uh, to submit them to the bar uh, every month to ensure that they're being uh, completed. And then uh, finally, of course, disciplinary action. So a range of options depending again on prior history and on severity and of uh, potential harm to the client or the public. Uh, so that's the elements of uh, analysis and action. Uh, we can get to the next slide, Louisa. Thank you. So now uh, in, in terms of attorney support, uh, there are a variety of ways that states do this. Um, again, a number which we've spoken about before. Uh, CLE, uh, the use of checklists and self-assessment tools as part of that, continuing legal education, uh, an education function, going out uh, to local bar associations, to law schools, and to certified public accountant meetings and explaining how this process works and how these accounts are to be managed. Uh, and then the use of multimedia, uh, whether that's videos, podcasts, uh, e-newsletters, whatever it happens to be, to keep the issues in front of. Sometimes that's done in the form of ethics uh, questions that get answered and then that implicate these issues. Uh, and then lastly, there are a couple of programs that, that provide a more substantive practice management or mentor or supervision type of support for uh, attorneys. Again, because the locus of problems consistently in every one of these jurisdictions is on small offices, solo or under six attorney type offices that, that don't have, a, a, whose resources are stretched and who are, met, are wearing many hats inside a small office. And then two uh, final elements. Uh, 
utilization of IT, it may go without saying, but I will say it anyway. Uh, California, it's no surprise to say, is the largest state bar and the scale of its operations in every uh, instance is, is quite a bit larger than anyone else. It is, for example, nine times, if we were to do 2%, you know, an audit, a random audit of 2% of the bar's uh, licensed attorneys, that would be nine times the number of attorneys that New Jersey does. New Jersey uses nine full-time staff, including a certified fraud examiner, certified public accountant, and four, uh, no, six auditors. So uh, the scale means that automation of, of this, whatever program the committee, if the committee decides to go forward with a program, automation of as much of it as possible is key to it succeeding. Um, the information that the bar would collect uh, obviously has no benefit unless it's used. And, and to make the best use of it, uh, it has to be prepared for those who are going to examine and analyze it. And so automating online forms, linking records, automating the red flag detection, automating priors. So all of that kind of data side, which would ensure that uh, repeat offenders are not being overlooked or are flying under the radar um, would, would go away. And also it would just create a great efficiency on the staff level of processing the amount of information that would be coming in. Uh, lastly, uh, client support. This was uh, one I added. Uh, just I, do, I don't have examples from other states, but as someone who has himself once or twice been a plaintiff in a case, I can tell you, you have no idea what your rights are. You don't know what to expect in terms of these accounts, how it should be done, how it should be reported to you, and so on. So just simply having some kind of informational uh, piece on the website, a brochure, a podcast, something, so you know, can I ask my attorney for this? And if I ask them, what are they obligated to do in response to my request? It goes back to the example that was given earlier of universities informing students of their rights. It's a similar kind of thing. You don't know how to exercise them if you don't know what they are. So that could be done in different ways by the state bar. It could be required of attorneys who open client trust accounts to inform their client. This is what a client trust account is. These are my responsibilities to you. And this is how those are, are carried out. So that's a final piece uh, for these of these program elements. And now here they are just summarized down the left side and you can see the function they mostly pertain to. All of them have an educational side because to the degree that this just keeps the issue in the program in front of attorneys, it has that function. Some of them have a deterrent function as you can see and, and the detection function. You obviously can't detect a problem unless you're auditing, so perhaps goes without saying. Uh, and obviously the follow-up off of an audit can reveal further problems that might, that the audit is sort of the clue, the clue uh, to the auditor to look a little deeper. Um, so these are the elements uh, that make up a proactive client trust management program. And we can now move to the consideration of the committee's uh, discussion and, and direction it wishes to indicate. Uh, thank you for all that information. Uh, it's really, really helpful. Uh, let's talk a little bit about what your goal is at, with this discussion. Okay, yeah, what, what we're, I think, hoping to do here was really try to narrow the field a little bit. Um, for example, uh, is it, does the committee wish to contemplate a, an Alberta style uh, program in which there is full uploading of all account information to uh, a CPA firm that does, houses that information in a secure uh, data warehouse, Firms are required to use one of eight certified packages. In other words, an entire automated system for universal audits. So if that's something that the committee thinks it wants to consider, we could certainly get more detailed information about that. But if that's a non, 
if that doesn't seem like the appropriate solution for California, then we could simply sideline that for now and focus on the areas where the committee wishes uh, to get more information uh, so that it can come to a final, uh, its final recommendations in a few weeks about uh, client trust account management. Jose, I have, a, I have a question. Sure, go ahead, Ruben. In my sense from our discussions and anecdotal uh, information that I've gotten sort of just since these uh, issues have come up is that by and large, um, not by and large, that there is a certain um, proportion of attorneys in the state that just don't ever have occasion to touch a, try a client trust account, right? I, I'm, I've been, I've worked at firms the entirety of my career with the exception of one year uh, for a city in a public agency and in each of those um, circumstances never never had to interact with a client trust account. Um, when we're talking about a universal um, auditing system, for example, would it be the case that every, every attorney has to certify uh, or acknowledge that they do or they don't uh, have interactions with CTAs? And if they don't, then we sort of set them aside and then focus on the ones who do? Is that one of the scenarios that you're envisioning? Or am I, you know what I mean? Like, I just feel like, yeah, we can't, we can't universally audit all 250,000 lawyers in the state, right? So we need to narrow the, uh, the universe somewhat. People who never deal with them, um, I'm assuming just we shouldn't have to worry about. Yeah, it's interesting, Ruben, um, because we can probably get a um, begin to get a handle on that simply by everyone that's a government attorney, like setting aside, you know, law firms and how does it work within a law firm. Anybody that is a government attorney is not handling a client trust account. If you're working in a nonprofit organization, I guess you might if you get a settlement. Um, but we could begin to winnow down the 250,000, right, to like get a more reasonable sense of our universe. But can I ask you and maybe Highland, you know, in firms, um, how does it work? Because what you triggered for me is we have no entity regulation in California. You know, we don't regulate law firms. We don't have the ability um, right now to impose a requirement on a firm. And I think that may be different than some of these other models, certainly internationally. Um, but how does it work in a firm? Is there is there actually an attorney that is responsible for the CTA management? I think you would be better off asking plaintiff's firms that deal with it most often, because my experience has been much like Ruben's. I mean, we are firm because we do mostly defense side work. We really don't have a client trust account system or issue. It comes up pretty rarely. I'm aware of just a couple of them. Um, and, you know, there's an approval mechanism in place for, for it. There's a structure in place, but it is it comes up very rarely. And so I think it's the plaintiff side firms that have the most experience with it. Yeah, Leah, this is Mark. Let me chime in for a second. You know, that's an interesting question. And I, and I told you I did a little survey of some of the uh, plaintiff's firms. They didn't ask them that, but I think it would be um, helpful for us to do that. To, to do a survey of a number of these larger firms that do uh, have their uh, their accounts. And I can do that and report back at the next meeting. Um, and if I may, I, it's, this is so interesting. I'm sitting here at this meeting and I hired a young attorney who just recently passed the bar. And he wrote, he sent me the email saying, hey, do we have an IOLTA account, client trust account? Because the bar is asking me, you know, to report this to the bar. So um, he, of course, is not going to manage it, and my firm does have one. Um, so I don't know. I heard. I thought I heard Richard say that not everybody has to report um, to the bar. So I'm, I'm just wondering if maybe Lee can comment on that. The other thing is, I heard Richard say, talk about IOLTA accounts and then just ordinary client trust accounts. And by that, I guess I'm understanding that there are two different kinds of trust accounts. I was only aware that if I'm handling client money, it's an IOLTA account and that there is no other 
account. So maybe you can comment on that for me. Maybe I'll learn something today. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Uh, Richard, you, we, we, do you have your hand up to help answer that? And maybe Leah, you can help as well. Yeah. Um, so yes, the, in the simplest form in terms of the registration piece, when people, when attorneys are, are uh, going through their annual uh, fee application, fee cycle, they simply check a box that indicates I do not have responsibility for these or I do. So that's the, that's the filter, if you will, for who's then in the audit pool uh, in most programs. Uh, and as to the second point, yes, there are two different types of accounts. The distinction being in a client trust account, you're gonna be holding that client's money for longer and the interest goes to the client. Whereas in an IOLTA account, you're pooling a bunch of money that's either less money or shorter term. And so the pooled interest goes to the state bar to pay for uh, civil uh, legal services. And right now, Mark, the rules that govern that um, leave it, it's very, it's pretty um, subjective and discretionary as to whether or not an attorney puts um, funds in a CTA or an IOLTA account. But it, the analysis is supposed to be if standing on its own, the interest would be of any kind of significant amount, then you'd put it in its own CTA as opposed to, no, it's kind of a nominal amount. So you pool it and put it in an IOLTA account. That may be something where we want to tighten up the rules a little bit, because I'm not even sure the banks know the difference between the two of them, because they are uh, frequently, at least my banker frequently will help me with these issues. Um, so it, we, we may want to tighten up those rules. Good point. So just to go back to Ruben's question and Highland's comment. So Richard, the way this would work practically would be everybody would be required to do some kind of registration. Your registration might say, I don't handle client trust accounts. Um, and I'm and I'm also committing to like, if that changes, I'll notify the bar. But if you say I don't handle them, you drop out of the pool that's being considered for an audit, right? Correct, that's the way most states do it. Okay, so Ruben, does that answer your question? Yeah, it does, uh, With just with the caveat that I have no idea what those numbers actually mean uh, or what those numbers could actually be, right? So, um, and I guess we'd have to wait until we did that survey or, or whatever it is. You know, are we going to end up with 25,000 lawyers in the state that right. might have done it? And, and uh, okay, Ruben, if, if, that, if you're done, I'll move yeah. on to Sean. I'm done. Yeah, thank you. Sean, go ahead. Thanks. Um, sorry, I had to turn my video off. I'm having a lot of internet problems today. It seems to be better with my video off. Um, so a few, I can respond to a few points. Um, I don't know the details of how trust accounts at a large firm um, like mine are managed, but we have we have professional financial staff. We have a chief financial officer. We have all kinds of internal controls. Um, only a few attorneys have signature, or or other personnel have signature power on that account. I don't even know who they are, but I will say that um, I have you know I have retainers that clients put in. Um, I've had some seriously large sums of money go through our trust accounts for clients. Um, and I'm just very careful on every occasion to issue specific instructions to the staff about how the money needs to be handled. So in other words, I take responsibility for making sure we're complying with these rules that we don't, for example, accept a check and then immediately uh, disperse funds. And, you know, we have to check that it, it's cleared and all those sorts of things. So I, you know, I think each attorney has responsibility to manage this process, not necessarily writing the check or doing that sort of thing yourself, but you have to make sure that funds you're in charge of directing are handled consistently with the rules. <clears throat> um, I have on several occasions opened separate accounts for individual clients because um, the funds were didn't meet the definition of what can go into IOLTA, which is that they are either nominal or short term. And the test for that is exactly what Leah described. Um, so um, 
the banks know how to do it. It hasn't been a problem. I've done it easily. Uh, I've done it at um, multiple firms. Um, so I don't know that I don't know that that's a big issue for clients. I mean, the only thing I would say is <clears throat> a separate account is probably safer for the client um, because uh, the money that goes in is going to have to equal what comes out, and you don't have the problem of an account with you know many many clients' money intermingled and. Um, improper practices can kind of be concealed by that. Um, but I don't know that we would want to look at that as a means of um, improving security because uh, first of all, it would you know would impair the IOLTA funding system um, and it would be pretty cumbersome to open separate accounts for every client. Uh, I want to come back to the automation. I have two more points. Come back to the automation point. I think it is worth looking at that. It would be uh, I don't know if it's it really, fe we should find out if it's really feasible to have some kind of automated solution that can meaning meaningfully um, look through all these files and spot possible red flags for human um, investigation. But it's certainly worth looking at. And it would be, I think, a pretty significant deterrent if attorneys had to submit that information you know, every quarter or it, whatever. Uh, knowing that it could be audited at any time and that deterrent effect could be very helpful. Um, and um, final thing I would say is, um, I think I had mentioned this to someone early on in the process and I think it was before you arrived, Leah. I, I think we should consider engaging a forensic auditor to advise us on the best ways to, uh, to effectively root out um, uh, misconduct or negligence in these files, um, because some of the, you know, just auditing the, the bank accounts, I think everyone agrees is not always going to turn up a problem, but I think it would, it would help if all, not just the bank account records, but all the records that the rules require attorneys to maintain are, reg, you know, subject to some kind of review on a regular uh, basis. So anyway, those are my thoughts. Thank you, Sean. Mark, your hand is still up. Did you have anything else? Oh, you took it down. Thank you, Mark. Um, Ruben, did, your hand is still up. Did you have anything else? Yeah, I did actually, just based on Sean's um, last comments there about uh, uh, engaging a CPA. I, I sort of, I've approached this, um, this issue with that in mind, right? Like one of the potential solutions or one of the steps um, that I've had conversations and I know with Sean about and, and others is um, should the bar bring in-house um, certified public accountants, right, to assist in these in these efforts in this specific um, area. And I, I don't know whether that is uh, something that uh, Richard, you have witnessed. Um, it sounded to me like you were talking about more um, other other state bars partnering with. CPAs or requiring that law firms or lawyers partner with CPAs. But I think one of the things that I would like to discuss seriously is, you know, at what point should we consider recommending that the, the organization bring that function or part of that function in-house um, to assist our, our professional staff? Good question. Mark, did you have something else? Yeah, yes, I did. And I, sir, I was on mute before. And, and Sean raised uh, the thought to me that, you know, one of the issues that we learned from Girardi was that because he had so many clients' um, funds in the same account, it was next to impossible to be able to account or to find the things that were going on. To me, that speaks uh, a little bit to um, it's easier to, to discern these um, improper uh, things if we have separate accounts. I know I have several separate accounts, whether that's right or wrong, but it is easier uh, when you're not commingling, so to speak, client funds, just something to think about. The other thing I thought about when Richard was um, giving his presentation is that, you know, to cover the costs of these forensic accountants or things that we may be talking about, you know, we already have, I think it's 40 or $50 that attorneys pay into uh, for the client security fund, 
if we add, I hate to say this because I'm only talking against myself, but on the other hand, if you have another $10, $10 or so to the attorney's uh, fees to specifically cover the cost of these things, I think it may go a, a long way to helping us um, if we decide to have some systematic uh, approach to this. Thank you, Mark. Anyone else with any comments? Um, Leah and Richard, I, I, I guess I'm coming away with the, I think there's been a lot of great content here and a lot of great options uh, put on the table and, and good research into what's going on in other places. My, my reaction is I'm not sure that I'm hearing from the committee members um, or, my, or me that we know enough about how to make these calls as you put up on this chart right here. And I wonder if we could uh, consider perhaps doing some more research, um, maybe putting together a timeline that says we'll go and survey the, the, the industry in the state of California, uh, get some idea of the size, maybe, maybe staff could, and you guys could draft uh, a, a, a proposal that maybe we somehow do some version of putting out for public comment so that, that the industry could, could react. Um, I also like the idea of uh, talking to some actual CPAs, some accounting firms, some auditing firms, getting their thoughts about, you know, how they would typically tackle, you know, an industry that has, you know, I'm sure they might have different ideas uh, depending upon the complexity of the, of the landscape that occur and, and how many complex scenarios are there and how many simplistic ones are there. Um, so on and so forth. I, I just, I'm not sure I'm hearing uh, people having, feeling like they have enough information to make recommendations on these actual questions right here. What do you think? Um, um, I, I think maybe we've gotten a bit further afield than this slide. So this slide is really just looking at annual, the first question, annual registration of all accounts. Really just asking the committee is this something we want to consider um, potentially as part of our program design? If yes, we'd, we'd say it's continue to explore. If no, we'd remove it from consideration. I, I think it goes in the continue to explore. Um, that annual registration of all accounts might um, result in a large number of attorneys, even the majority of attorneys indicating they don't handle client trust accounts and therefore they're excluded from any like further review or auditing. But I guess I'll say, I feel like this particular slide is not really getting at auditing yet. It's just, do we want to have the information about all of the client trust accounts that are out there? That's like really the first one. Without registration, we really can't do anything else. So for me, that one seems like kind of a, you know, an obvious yes. But maybe we can pause with that one. Um, if someone on the committee disagrees with me, right, let me know. But otherwise, I don't know that that one requires further study. I, I, I would certainly, personally, I would absolutely agree that the, the bar should know of every place that there is a client trust account. And whether that's a registration through an automated system or some sort of a filing every year or every whatever we would set up as the process, but certainly I think knowledge and understanding, having the information we don't have today is, the, is to your very points, step one. And, and then this designation number, oh, I see Melanie has her hand up. Oh, please go ahead, Melanie. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. My apologies for joining late. Um, you know, as you were talking, Jose, and I did get a chance to read the materials, but it kind of made me think, you know, oftentimes with the big four, they have think tanks, right? And so within the think tanks of the big four, you typically are able to present because they've got folks who are just kind of thinking through strategically your challenges or your issues. And, and because I'm so private sector focused, I'm going to apologize. But I didn't know if anything like that existed in the public sector, because what I'm thinking about in my mind is the ability to talk to someone at the big four where you really say, you know what, this is the issue that we're facing. 
these are this is the challenge with client trust accounts but we're trying to figure out in a state where you have 260 plus thousand attorneys recognizing that not not a significant number of people have management of that but let's just pretend and say 10 percent do or let's just say five percent right what would be the type of program because i think that i appreciate coming back with the benchmarking information but the question feels like it should be posed to someone in a think tank kind of situation where they could come back with some sort of potential solutions that then could turn into a pilot project. I don't know if I'm out the box or not, but that's just kind of where my thought pattern resides. And I don't know how that works in a public agency, but that's, as you were talking, that just kind of hit me. Thank, thank you, Melanie. I, I think you've, you're elaborating on something I was saying, which is, uh, I think there are, is expertise out there that we still could be discussing to talk about how to craft this. But I think to your point, Leah, I think the fundamental point that I think you correctly were making, Leah, was we do obviously as a state bar need to have knowledge uh, where, of where client trust accounts exist. And, and then we can build on that foundational knowledge, what we want to do to regulate and, and make sure they're done safely. Richard, do you have your hand up to speak? I do. Um, okay. So, and I think one thing that's important to think about here is um, which function we're talking about, because uh, my personal opinion is that some of the program characteristics for what 98% of these programs do, which is education and support, are, are fairly straightforward. Um, registration, auditing, and then uh, education, whether that's continuing legal education uh, and so on. So I think that piece, which is in every jurisdiction, the bulk of what they do, uh, I'm not sure that that's uh, too complicated. The complication and the, and the sophistication comes in, how do you use these kind of programs to detect fraud, which is between one and 2% of the cases. That I agree, arguably is, is relies on a serious fraud examiner and a certified public accountant expertise and, and the kinds of data analysis. And that's a whole, that's a whole uh, piece of this that's important to figure out in a sophisticated way. But I'm not sure that that should um, uh, hold up the, 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 because we don't have the baseline data, as you've said. So it's going to be a while before we even would have the data that we would need, that anyone would need, whether it's the bar or the fraud examiner or CPA to, to understand what the profile of these accounts look like. I, 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 think that, I think that's exactly right. And I think that what we're maybe, what maybe the best way to approach the points you put on this slide here is, do these as kind of fundamental um, fundamental um, components of, uh, you know, a, a safety, uh, safe oversight of client trust accounts, do these stand up as, as, uh, as appropriate foundational concepts? Registration of the accounts with the state bar, uh, you know, designation of responsibility within a firm, um, obviously some sort of acknowledgement of compliance with the rules and the, and the procedures for managing um, these accounts and, and further. Uh, I think those are, at least from my point of view, the right things to be uh, building on. Um, and then maybe to your point, Richard, we'd still need more information to figure out, you know, kind of how does that play out? What do you think, Leah? I think it, it makes sense, but just to your comments and Melanie's, um, we, we have been um, proceeding on this effort with the idea in mind that this committee is going to come up with a recommendation for a program design to be submitted to the board in November. Another approach would be, or it's a modified approach, is to do something like, I'm not sure we're ready to do an RFP, but we could do an RFI, some kind of more um, informal solicitation to try to get ideas from potential um, 
vendors as to how they might implement this program. And I'm thinking of Price Waterhouse Coopers because I think Richard, they are hired by somebody. Is, isn't PwC the auditor for one of these programs? And they are the auditor for uh, Alberta, Canada. So that's the model where they're uploading uh, the, you, you can either report, you, a CPA and a law firm may issue two reports or they can just upload all the transaction data uh, to Pricewaterhouse through this portal. Right, so we, we could, um, I mean, we, we can continue with what we hope to do today, which is to go through these different program element slides and talk through, you know, what's going to stay on the drawing board for now, understanding that we have to get additional information. We could pause on it and try like a different approach, which is soliciting more of a proposal. I'm not sure. Um, and maybe uh, it will exist that we could actually just consult with more in that more of a think tank way for people to come up with ideas for us. But we could think about that. Um, certainly what we would do is other states that employ any external parties, that's where we would start in trying to get ideas. So that, I guess that's what, what I'm thinking, Jose, they're kind of right. two different ways of going about it. Um, I do think on even just on this slide, designation of a responsible attorney by firm and a law firm plan, it would be helpful for us to have a better understanding of how it works in those in law firms that do manage client trust accounts to see if that's even realistic. Because is it realistic to ask for one designated responsible attorney? I don't know. I don't, I don't know enough about how it works. And is it realistic? I guess there should be a written plan or procedures in a law firm. Um, but that's work we could do, right? We have the ability to survey attorneys all over the state and law firms. So I imagine you'll find a real difference in how law firms deal with it. I mean, some law firms are structured so that the individual partners are their own personal corporations, oh. in which case they may be responsible for their own client trust accounts. And some, you know, LLPs do it differently. So I think we're going to find a lot of differences. Okay. Okay. Jose, this, oh, this, is, this is Ruben. I'm sorry, I'm on the phone. Yeah, so I don't know how to raise my hand. Um, just a question. I, I think it would be helpful um, for us to take a look at the rules of professional conduct that touch on this issue, whether there are one or more. You know, Sean referenced, um, you know, uh, getting a retainer from clients, and, and certainly I've I've seen that happen in my firm, and and I've asked clients for retainers in the past, so I know that there are or should be rules that. Um, govern, you know, govern how we do that. And I don't know how detailed they are, um, but it would be helpful, I think, to, to just have that as a point of reference um, moving forward. So, uh, Leah, if, if somebody could, somebody from OGC maybe could shoot that to us, uh, yeah. I think that'd be helpful. Okay, I think in our next meeting, we can actually have Randy Defim Torm from the Office of Professional Confidence. Give us That'd be great. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I think Leah, I think you're 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 spot on. I think that you know maybe we could consider a pause because I think you know the the what I'm not hearing that there's a font of knowledge out here in the committee that says you know they have definitive um, opinions on on many of these things one way or the other, but rather maybe hearing more about how best practices are working in other places where we hear they have a, a better handle on it um, uh, could be uh, more informative. Okay. Um, Richard, do you wanna just let's advance through some of the slides to see if there's any other areas that the committee feels like giving an opinion about today? Yeah, sure. Before we do that, just one, one clarification on this piece. Um, the designation of a responsible attorney is really uh, in a sense of convenience for the firm. And in, in North Carolina, you can designate more than one um, trust account uh, oversight officer. So it's just a way of allowing them to, rather than have every attorney in the firm reporting to central, to allow them to centralize. So I think it was sold and, and is accepted as a convenience. The other piece is unusual and that is 
telling a law firm how to do its business, which is, as you pointed out at the beginning, that's sort of a different thing. Uh, telling them they must provide this plan to every attorney, et cetera, that's, that gets to a whole other place. But um, okay, as long as we just see those two things are slightly different. Uh, Louisa, maybe, shall we go to the next? All right, so now we're on uh, how selection is done for auditing. The flavors here are universal, uh, random sample, or risk-based. The universal we've talked about a little bit, um, random sample we haven't discussed so much, and risk-based, um, you really need to build up a bunch of data in order to create a risk profile. I, I, I don't think simply going from the complaint data is a sufficient, you know, I, as a social scientist, that's not really a sufficient basis for, uh, for, for deciding what's at risk. And what it's gonna show you is it's, it's small firms and solos that are the root of a lot of the fund-based complaints and they're engaged in uh, personal injury cases and civil litigation. That's, that's essentially what we know right now. Um, but that's not a risk profile. That's just a descriptive statement. Any thoughts on, on those? Not, um, why don't you keep moving ahead? I think we want to advance the slide, Louisa. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I think you've gone too ahead now, Richard. Oh, right. All right. All right. So now we're at frequency, uh, annual, annual is exemptions based on audit recency, exempt for an X amount of months based on an independent CPA report or periodic. Um, I think the answer to this question really depends on, in part, on the, on the pre, it's related heavily to the previous one um, in terms of who's getting audited. The question of how frequently is also a capacity question. Uh, so the two go hand in hand, I think. Yeah, Mark, you have your hand up. Yeah, the, oh, I wanted to throw in that, you know, um, people that are uh, handling a lot of client trust accounts um, will be opening and closing those accounts frequently. So um, it may be that an annual report is probably not enough or it might be too much. What I would look at is, um, you know, when you open the account, that can be um, disclosed to the bar, but when the account is closed, that should also be um, disclosed to the bar. And one of the things that I, I would imagine every single attorney who's handling a trust account is going to do is they're gonna to have to give an accounting to the client of the amount of money that went into the trust account, you know, and the amount of money that's coming out. I, I suppose that it, you could be stomping on some of the issues related to uh, attorney-client privilege, but the the accounting could be something that that the bar could take a notice of, because that would tell you if the accounts balanced during that period of time. Yep. I also think that the frequency has to go hand in hand with. I mean, all of this is gonna be constrained by the resources available to us, but also it's gonna to go to what is most effective. I mean, if you think about the IRS and how often they do audits, obviously they can't audit every single taxpayer, but you know, because the threat of an audit and the consequences that could result if you get audited and it turns out you underpaid are so significant that tends to keep people in line to some extent. Um, and so I think it also goes hand in hand with what are the consequences we impose, right? If it's uh, an annual audit, that may keep people in line. But if you do it less frequently, the threat of more severe penalties could also serve the same sort of deterrent effect. Um, and I think some of this is just going to be dependent on what resources we have to do it right in the first instance. Yeah. I Thank you, Highland. I think that you, you've actually prompted a couple of thoughts in my mind and I'm glad, I'm glad uh, you did because I want to raise this. I think, I think what's important to note here is there's a difference between the concept of, of reporting and the concept of auditing. 
And in your IRS comment, Highland reminded me of that. And of course, it's true over here and with all tax collection responsibilities. Requiring somebody to report can be as complicated or as simplistic as we want it to be. But what it does is it does some very simple things that we've already talked about numerous times. It tells us who's the universe of players that have client trust accounts. The reporting might also contain how many client trust accounts do you have? So we know the magnitude that an individual attorney or firm are handling. What's the balance in? So we can think about the magnitude of the dollars involved. How many clients do you hold trust accounts? So we can think about the number of public citizens that, that this could be impacting. Simple reporting is not, I think, very different, Richard, than what we should be considered audits. So I think lumping every, every contact into this concept of you know, frequency of audits is really, we need, to, we need to, I think, bisect it at least into frequency of reporting and then something called audits, which is something that's a further effort, whether it's undertaken by an independent CPA or whether it's undertaken by the state bar and so on and so forth. So I guess my, my reaction here would be that I think we are, we are blurring the line or, or blending too much between reporting and audits. And I think there's separate purposes and realities to each and value to each. And Sean, I see you have your hand up too. So let's go to the... Sure. So uh, Jose, that's really helpful. I think that's an important kind of framework to keep in mind. Um, you know, here's my view about the audits. We, we, we've had at least two cases I know of in the last few years where an attorney has either been found or is accused of basically stealing millions of dollars. And so measures that involve some level of trust of the lawyer are feeling unsatisfactory to me now, even though it's just a tiny, tiny percentage of lawyers who are outright dishonest uh, in, in stealing client funds. Um, we wanna do everything we can to prevent this. And so part of that involves reducing our reliance on trust and that means things like certifications by the attorney and so on and so forth um, don't completely resolve that issue in my mind. They could be helpful. And the more detailed they are, as, as in the memo explains, I think helpful, like, you know, you have to check off, yes, I've done my monthly reconciliation every month this year. I've, I have a separate ledger for each and every client, you know, because then they're in even more trouble uh, in terms of discipline if it turns out those representations to the bar are false. Um, but with the audits, we have, we have a couple of problems. We have the vast size of the attorney population in California. We have the expense of the audits and how to fund them. Um, and just the practicality of that. It seems to me as I think about it, larger firms like mine are audited by major accounting firms every year. And I don't know exactly where the threshold is for that. If it's you know, typically firms of 100 or more lawyers or 500 or more, or if it just depends on the firm. But we could look into that. And I would assume that that auditing includes an audit of our trust accounts. And therefore, we have a number of firms, I would think, who are already capable of submitting an audit report every year to the bar. Um, and I, uh, Sort of what I have in mind is if we think about possibly requiring submission of an audit every year or perhaps on some other schedule by every lawyer who maintains a trust account that meets certain criteria of either uh oh looks like Sean froze just require them to submit their information. <laughs> Hey, but, hey, um, hey, Sean, we, we lost yeah. you for a couple of minutes there. You, you should probably cover what you said in the last minute. Oh, all right. Let me turn the video off again. Um, I had emails with my ISP and they I thought they had fixed the problem. Um, but so the big picture point is um, with funding, I think the way to fund this is to require the lawyers to, who, who need to be audited to, to hire an, a CPA that is approved by the bar uh, as knowledgeable about our specific standards about trust accounting in, in addition to auditing generally and submit that audit to the bar and maybe also require submission of the underlying data. Um, and then there can be random audits of those materials, right? They'd already be on hand. Um, and so we'd have another double check um, 
that way. So I'm just thinking that that's that has to be the funding model because otherwise um, this is just not going to work. Uh, so those those are some some thoughts. Thank you. Anyone else? I, you know, just to piggyback on what Sean said, there's also in terms of the big firms, the ones, you know, everyone carries malpractice insurance, those insurers typically will come in and do, uh, you know, sort of loss prevention review every few years. I know our firm goes through that every few years and our insurer comes on site and goes through a massive binder of checklist items, including financial controls and the rest um, that we have to you know, and then they give us a full report on here's where you're doing well, here's where you need to improve. So I think there are existing tools we can build on. And, and I find that very interesting what you, Highland, you and, and Sean, you are saying, which is, and, and I think we see this, of course, in many different venues, but clearly the dynamics and the behavior of a very large and um, complicated firm and the way they run their firm and the way they do things and the way they self audit and they get malpractice insurance and do all those things. It's very different um, entity certainly than a sole practitioner attorney who's just going to, as Mark, you relate, going to their banker and saying, hey, I wanna do the right thing. Can you help me figure out how to you know, open an account for my client's money? And I, I really think we may need to also consider that, you know, kind of a one size fits all solution is not maybe the, the best answer when we have such extreme variation in the types of entities we're dealing with. Certainly, if we were to see that there's a, there's a best practice set of practices for the very large firms, which I think we just heard about from Sean and Hylin, then I would think we would say, uh, uh, to your point, Richard, you know, a cause for suspicion uh, would be to come across a large firm that doesn't get itself audited every year, or doesn't, you know, uh, use malpractice insurance, or doesn't bring the binder into the office like Highland talks about, and 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 have uh, a certified public accountant clean audit report, uh, annual report that they could submit to us and anybody else every year that would be a suspicion. Now, not having uh, you know, malpractice insurance or a certified public accountant review would not be, that would not be a similar uh, trigger of suspicion for a sole practitioner though, because he or she wouldn't warrant that type of, of an effort. So I do think we have to be careful that we're also looking at an industry that has vast um, differences in the, in the operations of its members and treatment of them might appropriate, therefore vary. And in doing so, we, we really will have to keep in mind the fact that we don't regulate entities right now. We don't regulate law firms. That's very interesting. Yeah. Do you want to move on from this slide now? Sure. All right. And, and, and on that point, I mean, one could regulate these client trust accounts by size, and the largest ones are going to end up in the largest firm. So I think I think Jose's point about figuring out how the variation, how do how we could approach that is a deserves a lot more thought. Okay. So now who conducts? Uh, Richard, I'm sorry, this, this is Ruben. Can I just jump in on that last point that you made? Because, you know, thinking about what prompted this working group, right, we've, we've got the special discipline case, um, which uh, is not a huge firm. Um, and I'm aware of, of many plaintiff's firms that are not large, large law firms, four or five, six lawyers, but that do have very large amounts of money um, on behalf of their clients, whether through settlements or, or even just covering costs for experts in a trial. Um, and so I, I think that the, the, the notion of the amount of money that goes through a law firm, uh, irrespective of the, the number of lawyers in the firm, is something that we should uh, keep track of, or at least think about keeping track of. Uh, 
we're looking at. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Ruben. All right. So on the question of who conducts, um, only Delaware. So you have state bar uh, staff itself. You have CPA firms. You can combine those in different ways or state bar certified CPA firms. So uh, Delaware contracts out to a CPA firm to do all the audits for uh, the state. They do about 60, as I recall. Uh, the North Carolina, New Jersey, and others, do, Connecticut, uh, Washington State, do uh, their internal uh, audit staff, um, New Jersey being the largest with nine uh, full-time, six auditors, a program director, and a fraud examiner, and a CPA. And then <clears throat> there are also uh, state bar certified CPAs who, um, who conduct these. And again, there's a lot of mix and match. So there are, there are programs that say, this is at our expense, but if we find, if we have negative findings, then we have the right to impose that expense on you. There are ones that say, no, it's your job to hire the CPA uh, and uh, it's your expense. And, and, and then the bar reviews those reports. Uh, and then obviously in states where the state bar is doing it with internal staff, that's, that's a cost that they're absorbing um, through somehow. So those are the, those are the flavors. And I think we've talked about this quite a bit today. Yeah. This one. All right, should we move on? Yeah. All right, so analysis and action. So the following similar pattern, uh, obviously where you have state bar staff doing the auditing, you have state bar staff doing the analysis. If you're using outside firms, there are models in which the outside firm is simply doing the audit and re sending that to the state bar to, to and they, they score those audits, uh, of course, but it's up to the state bar to figure out what to make of them, if you will, what, what remedial action, what, uh, sanction, if any. Um, there is, as we already discussed, the real time, uh, there's written statements and so forth. And, and again, you know, the overwhelming majority of this activity is supportive, educational, training, professional development, whatever you want to call it, for the attorneys who are typically in very, very small offices. So that's where the locus of attention is. Very few of them rise to the level of actual uh, discipline. And here we have just different, different types of uh, support. Voluntary CLE, there's no state requiring CLE on this topic unless that's used as a um, part of a probation or a sanction, if you will, after a find, audit finding, a negative audit finding. Um, uh, there are programs that make use of various media to do this. And again, mix and match these different support elements uh, to train up the attorneys so that they don't uh, continue to make the same kinds of mistakes. And then lastly, this idea of support for clients, either through the bar or the attorneys, so the clients know their rights so they can insist on them. Um, so that clients who believe that they are not uh, being, that their attorney is not responding, for example, know that they have a right to that response and they know that is the basis of a legitimate complaint or grievance. Uh, similarly, if they, if they ask for an accounting and don't get one, they need to know they have the right to that and that, um, and that uh, the refusal to provide it in a timely manner is a, is a grievable complaint. So what we were going to do at the end, Jose, is just go through the roadmap. And I think um, for the 12th, based on sort of where we are today, I'm, I'm feeling like this group would really appreciate our bringing forward more of a proposal that wasn't just generated by us. So if we can get some consultation um, with some experts, um, I think we can try to for the 12th, I'm, I'm really thinking we would focus on perhaps Alberta, Canada, correct me if I'm wrong, Richard, 
where they have the most extensive program and they use PricewaterhouseCoopers because we may actually be able to have some conversation and do something by the 12th of October um, rather than starting from scratch. Um, so I, I think we can commit to trying to bring that forward and also maybe a plan for getting information. Mm -hmm. um, what kinds of information do we need about our attorney population and, and law firms and how they work in order to help us advance this conversation? Because we're operating a little bit in the dark. Um, so maybe we can you know, commit to doing both of those for the 12th, as well as what we are slated to do is to turn to um, the, a new topic, which is malpractice insurance. That sounds good. Um, I think that sounds great. And I think, I think at least like a, a, some, sign of, some sort of a proposed um, approach would be very helpful uh, for the committee. So thank you for that uh, suggestion, Leah. Um, I also might add, I wonder if you brought up a point, Leah, a minute ago that I think is also uh, pertinent, which is that the state bar only has regulatory authority over individual lawyers and not over organizations, the firms, if they create one. Um, I wonder, Richard, if that's the true in all other jurisdictions, or are there any other jurisdictions that have somehow added some authority to um, directly examine and or regulate um, and even discipline organizations of any type, uh, as opposed to just individual attorneys? Uh, yeah, that, that bears uh, looking into my impression, uh, but I'll say this saying that all of these things uh, deserve some further thought. My impression is, uh, is no, they, they regulate this at the individual level. That's who they are licensing. Um, obviously, somehow in Florida, they have this other rule. So how that was in, put in place and, and what that reflects about their regulatory cap uh, authority, and, uh, I look forward to finding out for you. And, 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 not, and not only that, but so if, if it is the case that they only regulate and can, can govern and discipline individuals, how do, you, how do you penalize or discipline a 50 attorney firm um, that you know, had a blended set of responsibilities and non-attorneys managing client trust accounts and a CFO, perhaps a non-attorney, so on and so forth, so, you know, do all the attorneys get to wash their hands and say, I wasn't in charge of the client trust account, so there's no one to discipline, or do they take some sort of individual responsibility for the part of the firm that they're part of? Again, answers to questions that probably exist somewhere in law, um, but it'd be useful to know what they are here. Okay. Okay, anything else for the upcoming meeting that folks would like to make sure we pay attention to, bring back information regarding? Yeah, I have uh, just, just a confirmation that um, the, the information that we gather on our, our attorney profile page, that um, that, that presents a you know, pool of data that we could Use to start to use to call you know call the information down or call the groups of attorneys down, right? Would that be the would that be the vehicle? Yes, um, that's okay. how we start. At least we, we collect information on practice sector, for example. So we can begin there. We don't collect information that tells us if you're in a plaintiff's firm or a defense firm. So I don't think. You know, within the private sector, we're not going to be able to do much within the law, you know, other than to say this number of attorneys is working in a law firm setting. Um, so we will see what we have, Ruben. Okay, great. Go ahead. The, other, the, the other thing we do have is data that uh, the State Bar's research staff have compiled about that's based on complaints and, and specific allegations about investigations on the basis of specific rules. So the bank overdraft notice uh, complaints and other things. So we have that data uh, parsed out by these practice areas, by the demographics and so on. And we can, uh, if it would be helpful, we could 
summarize that. Uh, again, it's the complaint based, so there is that, but at least to give some glimpse as to what we know now. Well, it's not, it's not complaint based. We do get those reports by bank. And Melanie, those are all I all, all trust accounts, right? It's not just IOLTA accounts, the R, the RAs. Uh, they they would I think they're just IOLTA accounts. Really? Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Good stuff to look into. Okay. Well, I think we can end this meeting a bit early then and we have our work for us for the next meeting. Great. Great. Thanks, team. All right. Thank Thanks, you. Leah. Thanks, Richard. Good seeing you, everyone. With that, we'll adjourn the committee meeting. Thanks, everyone. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.